Good evening and welcome to Lowell Observatory's ongoing celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Um, this is one of the most powerful telescopes in the world. And throughout this year, every month, we're presenting programs highlighting um, different aspects of the telescope. Um, we started with talking about um, the origins of it, why we built it, uh, how it came to be. And then for the last several weeks, we've been talking about different uh, types of research done with it. Uh, this week is a, is a theme that I think a lot of people find very exciting. Um, not just the people you're gonna hear from, but out there in the world, because we're talking about planets around other stars or exoplanets. And so we've got three eminent um, researchers here tonight, Dr. Deborah Fisher of Yale University, Dr. Joe Lama of Lowell Observatory, and Dr. Catherine Clark um, of Lowell Observatory for another month or two. Um, and so we're gonna be um, hearing from each of our guest speakers for, they'll each talk for about 10 minutes about what their research involves. And then after that, we'll just kind of open it up for discussion um, at any time during the program. If you have questions, just send those in the comment box and um, we'll get to those at an appropriate time. We might do some during the presentations, otherwise we'll get to them during the discussion. Um, so we're really pleased um, to celebrate 10 years since first light of the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And it's really been quite an awesome ride and, and the research being done with it is, is just really um, cutting edge, taking Lowell and our partner institutions and really astronomers from around the world into the next era of research. So first of all tonight, we're gonna to hear from Dr. Deborah Fisher. Um, Dr. Fisher is the Eugene Higgins Professor of Astronomy at Yale University. Um, she um, spends her time researching um, and detecting char and characterizing exoplanets. Um, she was part of the team to discover the first known multi-planet system and heads a project aimed at detecting 100 Earth-like planets. Um, that's quite a lot of stuff you have going on. Um, Dr. Fisher, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kevin. It's my pleasure. Um, Lowell Observatory is absolutely amazing. And as the sort of outsider um, in, in this team, I can actually brag about them uh, forever. I started working on the detection of exoplanets, that is planets orbiting other stars, in 1997. Uh, so quite some time ago, using this method called the radial velocity technique. And here the idea is that as the planet orbits its star, it actually tugs the star around a common center of mass. So if you could look with high enough precision, you could see the wobble of the star as it comes towards you and goes away from you using an instrument called a spectrograph. This spectrograph uh, measures the shift of spectral lines back and forth. We use that data then to uh, and model that data to infer the presence of planets that we never see. So that was true in 1997 and the early 1995 was the detection of the first exoplanet. But we knew that if we found enough planets that some of those planets would be in an orbit that was face on or ed, sorry edge on and in that case as the planet orbits its host star it would block out some of the light of the planet so for for years we actually worked on radial velocity radial velocity detection of exoplanets waiting for that one planet that would finally transit blocking out some of the light from its host star and proving that our interpretation was correct, that we really were finding planets. And indeed that happened in 1999. Um, <clears throat> so astronomers who doubted our data in the early days said that would be one of the things they would find convincing. And the other thing that they thought would be convincing would be a multi-planet system, um, a system where the planets, if they were more massive, if they were really stars, for example, in a triple planet system, it would be unstable. So we found both of those things just back, nearly back to back. So from then on in the sort of around 2000, um, I felt that, um, you know, we, we should try to push uh, the precision of our technique. We were finding at the time in the late 1990s, we were finding big Jupiter-sized planets in relatively close orbits. And that's because those planets caused the star to move with a speed of 100 meters per second. 
Now compare that to the earth. The detection of an earth with radio velocities is really hard because the earth only causes the sun to move with a speed of 10 centimeters per second or a, <clears throat> a tenth of a meter per second. And that period lasts for a whole year. So we have to hold the instrument to be incredibly stable and steady for that long period of time. So my whole career was really spent trying to see if we could push the limits of precision down. And with my team at Yale, we built two spectrographs that were kind of like practice learning uh, how to build spectrographs. And then finally, um, when I thought we knew everything that we needed to know to build like the dream spectrograph, it became Express, the extreme precision spectrograph. And I started looking for the right facility, the right observatory where we could put this instrument. And it turned out to be the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And here you see a picture of my graduate student standing next to the spectrograph that we finally built. It's a, as you can see, it's a rather large spectrograph. Um, right now you, you get the lucky uh, case of being able to see into the spectrograph because Currently, that spectrograph is closed up completely, that is sealed off so you can't see inside of it anymore. And it's in a vacuum enclosure. And then we have a thermal enclosure that's wrapped around it to keep it very stable. We're using technology that's cutting edge, the laser frequency comb, which won a Nobel Prize in 2005. And we're using this for wavelength calibration. So we put everything that we we thought we knew about measuring extremely high precision radial velocity measurements so that we could get down to earth detecting precision. We are almost there. I would say that we, uh, my team uh, is, and the team at Lowell are really, really leading the frontiers in the United States. We got on sky first, we've been operating since January of 2019. Uh, collecting data, and we have some really exciting um, discoveries that are about to be announced. The trick, though, is that when you look at a star, you're not just measuring the motion of the star as it's coming towards you and going away from you because there are planets there. It turns out that the surfaces of stars are boiling, gaseous, you know, plumes that travel at hundreds of meters per second. And so we thought if we only had the case, a test case where we know the answer in the back of the book, right, where we, we look at a star and we know for sure that the signal we're seeing is caused by planets and not just caused by activity on the surface of the star, then we could prove to the community, right, that we were on the right track. And so this is actually a perfect segue into we, you know, we commissioned Express at Lowell it's an amazing team, the everyone from the telescope operators, the director, the scientists who work there are just incredible people. Um, and just I've just never seen such a dedicated crew. And, and one of the Lowell astronomers is Joe Lama. And he's going to tell you about the test case, the perfect star, where we can figure out what signal is coming from planets and what signal is coming from the star. So Joe? And Joe, before you start talking, let me just um, say who you are. Thanks so much, Deborah. This is, we could talk all night about this stuff. You're gonna have a lot of great questions with this. Um, before we turn it to Joe, I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit more how you ended up with Lowell. Uh, was there you know, a call out for partners or uh, was it the, the telescope itself that, wow, this is perfect what we need? I mean, how did that come about? It was the telescope itself. So I had submitted a proposal to build a spectrograph, to build this dream spectrograph express. And the first time the proposal was turned down because they said, you haven't identified the telescope yet that it's where it's going to go. And so then um, I resubmitted a year later, that was a successful proposal, but it was successful because I started the hunt for the perfect telescope and came up with um, looked at several telescopes actually that were similar in size. Lowell has, is a four meter telescope. That's a large uh, telescope. Um, and, and the Lowell telescope also had a, the unique feature of when it was built, 
um, the the folks who were designing it were brilliant because they said, you know, we don't, um, one of the drawbacks of most telescopes is you have to put these big heavy instruments on the back of the telescope and you need counterweights. Um, and uh, the Lowell telescope was designed with a, an instrument cube on the back and that instrument cube allowed the mirror to rotate between five different ports. We just put a little fiber at our port for express that fiber goes down into the basement where the spectrograph lives. And it means that the Lowell astronomers can use uh, different instruments and we can just rotate the mirror and be on express uh, using partial nights and getting very high cadence, high sampling, frequent sampling of our stars. That's what we need it to be able to detect low mass planets. What, what exquisite timing. It was great. I basically went and begged, you know, I begged Jeff Hall, <laughs> the director, please, this is the perfect telescope. And I'm not sure they needed me. I needed, I needed you guys more than you needed me, I think. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Joe can maybe answer that question. Um, Dr. Joe Lama, who's been at Lowell Observatory since 2014, um, and um, he got his PhD from University of St. Andrews. So he was working on that when he started working here at Lowell Observatory. And as Deborah mentioned, um, uses Express, um, but it, but it's interesting because um, Joe is involved in comparing light from the sun, um, our sun, to light from other stars. And how do you compare this brilliant star that's close to us to the pinpoint of light from distant stars? Um, well, Joe has another telescope he um, created, I guess you could say. <laughs> um, that allows us to do this. And so he's going to talk about that a little bit. So Dr. Lama, let's hear from you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Deborah. Yeah, it's truly great. Um, we have this amazing synergy between the Lowell Discovery Telescope and our partner institutions. And I think the Yale partnership it highlights this to extremes. You know, it's really enabled me to do the science that I want to do, us having this amazing telescope and bringing in partner institutions that bring these incredible machines to work the instrument really hard. Uh, it's, it's really, really great. So yeah, as Deborah alluded to, um, the kind of the ideal scenario is looking at a star really up close and personal. And there's very few stars you can do that with. Uh, but one of them, as I'm sure everyone is familiar with, is the sun. And so Deborah touched upon how stars aren't just these, you know, constant emitters of light. They really are these, these cauldrons of bubbling gas and material. And all of those effects go to really induce a lot of noise in the data that Deborah and I collect at night when we're trying to search for planets. And so here you can see a really cool movie of a transit of Venus across the disk of the sun. And you can see in the bottom here, all these filaments and these big loops, these big magnetic features on the surface of the sun. All of that go to completely drown out that tiny signal from the planet uh, that we would see in the radial velocity data that we get from Express. And so Deborah touched upon how Express works to find planets. And so essentially what happens is having a planet in a system, not only does the planet orbit around the star, but it also causes the star to orbit around the common center of mass of the system. And so you can see here as the planet orbits, the star is also moving and that causes the light emitted from the star to be periodically red shifted and blue shifted as it moves towards and away from us. And instruments like Express are capable of making that, uh, determining the amplitude of that, that shift in the light down to incredible precision. As Deborah said, the signal induced from the earth around the sun is just 10 centimeters per second. You know, think about that. That's a really small distance. It's like that, that we're measuring on these stars millions and millions of light years away. It's incredible. And so this is, I love this plot because it shows you how great we're doing at finding planets. Every one of these squares here is a known planet orbiting a star you see in the night sky. But one thing you'll notice if I add in where the earth is, is we're doing really great, but we're also not doing so great on finding planets like the Earth. And the reason for that is exactly as Deborah said, it's really, really hard for us to find planets like the Earth. Not only do you need this incredible instrumentation, the laser frequency comb, uh, the next generation spectrographs that have only been online now for the last three or four years, you also have to be incredibly patient 
because the signal from an Earth orbits on a yearly time scale. And you, you know, astronomers, we like to be quite cautious. So we need to see that signal repeat two or three times before we can say, hey, look, we think we found something. And so I think as time goes on, you'll see this diagram get more and more populated with little points going closer and closer towards the location of the Earth. And so just re-expressing that plot in a slightly different way, I think this really hones in on how important an advancement instruments like Express actually are. Here along the bottom, the, the horizontal axis is just the date that a planet has been detected versus the mass, the size of the planet. And you can see from about 2010 onwards, we really had this plateau, we hit this limit, and we just couldn't get planets smaller than that. And there's a number of reasons for that. There's the instrumentation, but there's also, as Deborah pointed out, the host stars itself. Now, stars exhibit this activity, and that can completely drown out the signal from the star. And so what I've been doing at Lowell is looking at the star we know best, which is our sun. And so here you can see the sun over about a 20-year time scale, a 10, 15-year time scale. This is over a solar cycle. And you can see each of the points here is how active the star is in terms of radial velocity measurements. And you can see it, this amplitude, this envelope that engulfs this plot. It's about two to three meters per second up times. If I overlay the 10 centimeter per second amplitude of the Earth around the sun, that would be completely lost inside this data. And so one of the things that astronomers like myself and Deborah's team at Yale are really doing is working really hard to try and disentangle these two signatures. And so for my role, I use the sun to do that because I really like the sun, but also there's no competition for the telescope. None of the other astronomers at Lowell are using the, the LDT during the day. And they're really missing out because it's much easier to observe during the day than it is at night. Um, but this, this plot, this slide highlights sort of the, the things we're up against. And I've color coded them by how well I think we're doing in understanding them. And so all of these, these phenomena that you see here go into these measurements in the previous plot that completely drown out the signal from the small planet. So we've got these short timescale things like oscillations and granulation on the surface of the star. And we think we're doing pretty well there. Things like stellar flares, we've all seen these beautiful movies of stars emitting these, the sun emitting these beautiful flares. We pretty much understand those. We just tend to ignore those if we see those in our data. Things we're not doing so well on, though, are things like magnetic cycles and active regions. And the reason for that is because their periods tend to be similar in time scale to that of a planet like the Earth. And so it can be very confusing. You may see a one year signal in your radial velocity data like we get from Express, but you may end up not, but you may be confused between the magnetic cycle of the star and whether it's a planet. And so my role is to try and understand those signals and try and come up with the with the detection techniques to try and mitigate that, that false positive and figure it out. And so the sun comes to the rescue, mostly because we have this unprecedented view. We have this amazing spacecraft called NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, and it's constantly imaging the sun at all these different wavelengths from the ultraviolet here in the green and the, and the yellow through to the optical, what you would see if you put a pair of solar viewing glasses on and looked at the sun. Don't look at the sun without solar viewing glasses. But what we can do is we can take all this wealth of data that's taken at the same time as we take data of the sun with Express, and we can derive these correlations and try and determine how we can understand the stellar activity best. And so, as Kevin said, my pet project over the past few years has been to build a little telescope next to the 4.3 meter Lowell Discovery Telescope. Uh, the sun's very close, so you don't need a very big telescope to image the sun. And so my telescope is about the size of a pint glass edge on, if you look at the diameter. So it's 0 0.007 meters, as opposed to the 4.3 meter Lowell Discovery Telescope. But this telescope was installed back in 2000 and, uh, 2020 uh, with the help from our Lowell technical team. And essentially what happens is a fiber optic cable runs down under this green roof under the roadway and into the LDT, into the 4.3 meters and into Express. And so during the day, Express observes the sun using my solar telescope. And at night, Deborah and her colleagues take over and observe the stars with the big, with the big telescope.
And so we're really using Express pretty much 24 seven. It's a real workhorse instrument. And so Deborah already touched on this. This is the inside of Express. I'll hold my hand up. I've never actually seen this. They had it covered up uh, before, before I got to see it. And the image on the right here is a spectrum of the laser frequency code. And this really is our secret source for, for being able to detect these tiny, tiny signals. And you see each one of the, the black pulses going in the horizontal, going in the vertical, sorry, across the horizontal stripes there, those are shell orders of the spectrograph. And each one of those pulses is a very, very precise measurement that we can tie our wavelength solution to that lets us very, very precisely measure the radial velocity of the stars and the sun. And so I love this photo. This was taken back in January uh, with one of my colleagues flew up a drone and you can see the 4.3 meter in the back there. And you can just make out my tiny telescope on top of the, the green roof there. It's the one on the far right. The, the one next to that there is a, a camera system that measures meteorites coming into the earth. But my telescope is the one with the little bubble dome. Uh, it's very 1990s futuristic looking. Uh, I love it. But so we've been observing the sun with Express now for almost 18 months, and we've collected this incredible data set. We have about 30,000 observations of the sun. It's a huge undertaking to take this data, analyze it, and determine all these correlations that will allow us to tease out these tiny signals of Earth-sized planets. And we're doing really well. Uh, the instrument is really showing how well it can do this, where the top histogram here shows you that it peaks at around 60 centimeters a second. That is exactly what you would expect the amplitude of activity on the sun to look like. And so we're really probing stellar acti solar activity with Express. And so as time goes on, we'll continue to build this data set up. We'll run all sorts of fun experiments for our colleagues, like inserting these nine cent 10 centimeter per second signals and seeing if our colleagues are able to tease them back out. And so that's all I really wanted to say. Um, I think Lowell and the LDT is doing an incredible job. It brings these amazing partners to us that let us bring these instruments like Express that really revolutionize my science. And so as a result of Express coming to Lowell, it's really turned Lowell into a 24 seven observatory, very few other places observe all through the night and also at day. So uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks, Joe. And one quick question to clarify, I, you, you have no competition during the daytime. <laughs> like you said, That's right. at nighttime, there are, like Jebber was saying, there's the instrument key with five instruments. How much time at night is, is Express on the sky compared Express. to being used for other? Express is typically on the telescope almost every night it feels. At one point we were all you know, trying to do all the observing and it felt like every night we were on. But I think one of the, the real strengths of the LDT is how fast and flexible we can actually be. And so you know, our program to search for these hundred Earths doesn't need a whole night of observation. We're much better served with a few hours spread over multiple, multiple days. So we can really sample the orbit of the planet going around the star. And so I think, I forget the actual number, I'm sure Deborah, you know it off the top of your head, but I believe we typically are on the telescope for 70 whole nights about a year. So, and we typically observe in quarter nights. So probably around 250 nights a year, so we have at least some time on the telescope. And I think that's a real strength of the setup of the LDT partnership. There's very few other places where you could get that sort of cadence of and, observation. And we can talk about this a little bit more, but just a follow up to that. So do you have a feel for how many different um, different things are being viewed on a night on LDT on average? I mean, Express is looking at, you know, these stars, but there's all the other instruments. How many yeah, different that's... things? How many different things is it looking at at night? You know, at half dozen or more? Or... Oh, easily. I mean, typically when we're observing, we observe, you know, a half dozen to a dozen stars at a time. Uh, you know, whenever I take over the telescope, I feel like someone's observing an asteroid or something much closer to home with, uh, with the imaging device we have on LMI on the telescope. People observe spectra of galaxies. Um, you know, LDT in a night can span all distances within the, within the universe. It's, it's really quite cool. And that's what makes it what, what our former director, Bob Millis, called the, the Swiss Army Knife of Telescopes because it's so versatile. 
um, you can That's right. do all those things in one night. Yep, absolutely. Well, great. Thanks, Joe. Um, Thank you. I, you know, we'll keep talking, but we, we have, want to bring our, our third person in here. And I, Catherine Clark, um, if you look at our website, in fact, right now, her title is PhD student. Um, but that's a misnomer because as of, I think, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, it's now officially Dr. Catherine Clark, who graduated from Northern Arizona University. Um, she came to Flagstaff in 2017 to work on her PhD and worked with uh, Dr. Gerard Van Bell here at the observatory. Um, and her interest has been in both instrumentation and um, stellar astrophysics. Um, and gosh, this is one of the last times we'll be able to talk to you as a, as a Lowell staffer because in August, she's moving out to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory um, for her first um, job after earning her PhD. So it's really great to have all three of you on here, plus the freshly minted Dr. Catherine Clark. So uh, Catherine, come on in and uh, let's hear about your use of the LDT and how it's a little bit different than Deborah's and Joe's because you're not looking at the exoplanets per se, but um, let's hear how you're using it for these for this research. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction, Kevin. Let me share my slides. Oh, that's the wrong one. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Not wanting to switch uh, <laughs> to the other one. Let's see. It was working before we started the. Uh... <laughs> well, Deborah and Joe, as, as Catherine's figuring this out, um, how does it feel like, you know, Catherine is this newly minted PhD? Does it take you back to your days of, you know, just when after you got your PhD? What did that feel like for you guys? I, my days are too long ago. <laughs> as a PhD student. I don't know, but you never really forget, right, that your PhD thesis defense, it's so exciting and stressful. <laughs> so a huge congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and now, Joe, you must right. remember that. <laughs> I do. I do. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, <laughs> I think I've blocked the stress of the actual defense out. But, you know, I remember the, they after you do the exam, it's about a few hours long and they typically okay. they'll you know, they'll let you back in the room to let you know the decision and they'll either introduce you as, you know, congratulations, Dr. Clark, or right. I'm sure that I've never heard the other happen. So, you know, the first time you get told doctor is, uh, it's a special moment for sure. Yeah. All right, is my screen correctly sharing now? Great, so um, as Kevin said, um, Joe and Deborah have been studying how we can detect and characterize these planets in other star systems. Um, I study how multi-star systems can mess this whole thing up and make it more difficult to detect and characterize these planets. So um, we know that stars host planets, we see that in our own solar system, but stars can actually host other stars as well. So in our own solar system, we just have a single star system, we have our sun, um, but in many other star, star systems in our galaxy, maybe even up to half of the systems in our galaxy, they have more than one star. So if you imagine Tatooine from the Star Wars films, um, we have these multi-star systems. And so there are a few different ways that planets can exist in these multi-star systems. Uh, one way is called an S-type orbit or a um, circumstellar orbit. And so in this scenario, you have a planet that is orbiting one of the stars in the star system. Um, we also have P-type orbits or a circumbinary orbit. This is when a planet orbits in, uh, both stars in the star system. And we also have these T-type uh, orbits where you have a really massive star at the center of the system. You have a lower mass star orbiting around the more massive star, and you have planets orbiting in that same path as the low mass star. So there are these really interesting configurations going on throughout uh, our galaxy. But 
These stellar companions can, like I said, really mess up our detection and characterization of exoplanets. Um, they can induce false positives or they can make it more difficult to measure masses or radii of these planets that we're discovering. So we can see this with the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite or TESS. Uh, TESS is a space mission that was launched a few years ago and it observes the brightnesses of many stars at once. And it looks for dips in these brightnesses and these dips can be caused by a planet transiting or crossing in front of its host star. And so this is a pixel uh, from the test mission. Uh, this pixel, we're looking at the star hat P11. So you can see it as this really bright yellow splotch in the center of the pixel. But you'll notice that there are these other less bright splotches in the background. And so these are other less bright stars that um, are close enough to the star that you're trying to look at um, that either planets orbiting these background stars or if these stars are in fact binaries, it can really make it difficult to um, determine whether there is a planet crossing in front of the main star you're trying to observe um, or to characterize the planet that's crossing in front of that star. Um, so like I said, uh, these background stars can either have their own planets or they can be binaries. And you can see from these figures here that the light curve from a planet looks pretty similar to the light curve from an eclipsing binary. So on the left-hand side here, we have a light curve from the Trappist South Telescope of the star WASP-19. Uh, and this is a light curve from its planet WASP-19b. And then on the right, we have a test light curve of an eclipsing binary. And so on the left, this is the primary eclipse. Um, on the right, it is the secondary eclipse. So this is a system where the stars are close enough to one another that occasionally their orbits are such that um, the starlight from one star will be hidden by the starlight from the other star. And this causes uh, dips in brightness. And you can see that the shapes are kind of different. Um, the amount of light that is blocked is a bit different, but you can still get false positives when you have these really large missions searching for dips in the brightnesses um, that can be caused by these eclipsing binaries. So we therefore need to follow up these candidate exoplanet hosts. And there are a few ways that we do this. Uh, one way is with photometry. So this is when you're looking at the flux or the intensity of light that is emitted by various astronomical objects. Um, and so this allows you to identify false positives due to these nearby eclipsing binaries that are on the same pixel as the star that you're trying to observe. Uh, you can do some spectro spectroscopy. So uh, this allows you to constrain the masses and the radii of the exoplanet hosts. So when you're trying to find planets, uh, you're not only trying to understand the planets that are orbiting, but also the host stars. It's really important to understand the host stars, as uh, both Deborah and Joe have talked about. This allows you to better understand the planets. Uh, you can do precise radial velocity work, and this allows you to derive planetary orbits to determine planetary masses. So this um, has to do with Deborah and Joe's work on Express. And also you can do high resolution imaging. So this allows you to detect nearby stellar companions that you normally wouldn't be able to see. They're kind of hidden um, in the shadows of these really bright stars. So there are a few ways to do this. The way that I do this is a technique called speckle imaging. And the way that speckle imaging works is that um, when you have starlight from a star, uh, you expect it to be this point source, this one really bright dot. Uh, but the problem is that we're looking at these stars through our atmosphere. And the atmosphere is made up of these hot and cold cells that are really turbulent. And it causes the light from the star to be kind of smeared out. So instead of having just one single point of light, you have these um, dispersed speckles of light. They're called speckle patterns. So you can see this on the left-hand side. And we do, we take really short exposures of these speckle patterns and we do a bunch of math that I won't get into, um, but that allows us to actually remove the atmospheric interference from our data. And we get to the final image on the right, which shows a stellar companion 
uh, that we would not have been able to see through the atmosphere without using this technique. So to relate this to the LDT, for um, a number of years, we were using a speckled camera called DIZZY on the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And DIZZY um, is a really great instrument. Uh, you're asking how many targets you can observe in a night. Uh, with a speckled camera, you can observe hundreds of targets in the night. It's really, uh, because we have such short exposures, it's a really rapid observing cadence. Uh, you can jump from target in a matter of minutes uh, because of how great the pointing and the movement is of the LDT. So Dizzy did great work for us, uh, but part of my dissertation work was to build a new speckle camera for the LDT. Uh, this is work I did with my advisor, Dr. Gerard Van Bell. So you can see Quizzy, the new speckle camera mounted on the one of the ports of the LDT. So Quizzy is special because um, we use four cameras to observe um, these stars. And we observe these stars at six wavelengths at once. So four of these wavelengths are optical or visible wavelengths that we can see with uh, the human eye. And two of these wavelengths are gonna be in the near infrared. And so these are wavelengths that are so red that they cannot be seen with the human eye. Uh, but these are wavelengths where really small and cold and faint stars emit most strongly. And these small cold stars are some of the best places to look for planets with current instrumentation. And so um, Quizzy is very well suited to helping us make sure that um, there are no stellar companions nearby that could be messing up the data from Express and that uh, Deborah and Joe are working on. Uh, so this is one of our images. Um, this was observed with uh, Quizzy by our collaborator, Dr. Elliot Horch. And so this is a triple star system. You can see the bright primary star, the A component uh, towards the bottom of the image, the slightly less bright uh, BA component, and then the pretty faint BB component. And so this is pretty crazy system, very unlike what we see here in our own solar system, uh, but pretty exciting as well. So um, I have really enjoyed working with these systems and making sure that my fellow exoplanet scientists are getting the proper data that they need to be getting to find these cool Earths in other systems. That's great. Thanks, Catherine. In your, in your new position, will you be doing instrumentation also? Um, I won't be building any more instruments, but I'll actually be shifting to do some radio velocity work, um, kind of similar to what uh, Deborah and Joe have been doing. Uh, but for these cool faint stars, the young dwarfs rather than solar type stars. Mm -hmm. And is, was Quizzy based on the earlier design of DESI or was it just an advanced version or was it a completely different um, idea behind it? Yes, it's very, um, it's similar to uh, DIZZY. So DIZZY observes at two wavelengths using two cameras. Uh, with QUIZZY, we have the four cameras and the six wavelengths. So it's kind of an expansion on mm -hmm. the design that DIZZY originally implemented. Yeah, okay. Well, great, so those are great introductions. Um, Catherine, I, I guess you can stop sharing and then we'll just open it up for um, general discussion and questions. We have a couple of questions here that are a little bit um, kind of ask an astronomer that aren't necessarily in tune with our theme tonight, but we can maybe um, get those at the end. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the work. I do have one question here. Um, 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 Deborah and, and Joe, in, in terms of the planets you're looking at, um, are you discovering new ones or are these all ones that are known already um, that you're that you're surveying? I'll start, Joe, and then you can jump in. But um, yeah, we're, the planets that we're discovering, the first planets, we wanted to check, right, that everything about our data was correct. And so we, we intentionally observed some of the tried and true systems to make sure we could reproduce those detections, and we did. 
Um, and so that gives us confidence that the new signals that we're seeing, uh, which, and Joe's right, it has taken a couple of years to pound down, get enough data to be able to detect these very small amplitude systems. These are new planets that haven't been announced before. And in fact, there are planets that are a little larger than the Earth, uh, maybe a, a few times larger than the Earth to 10 times larger than the Earth, but they are out at distances from their host stars where they would be in the prospective habitable zone. That is the distance from the star where it's not too hot or not too cold and liquid water might pool on the surface of the star. I just wanna say there's also a really nice um, connection to Catherine's work because there's a lot of effort that goes into choosing the right stars that we observe to look for planets. And one of the first things we do is, is discard, reject any of the stars that host other stars, any of those binary star or triple star systems, um, because they probably introduce perturbations or at least will make our, our data more complicated and difficult to interpret. So yeah, new systems. Joe, do you wanna? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, one of the cool things about Express is that no other instrument could have found the planets that Express will find. Yeah. And so by default, they have to be they're these new and really exciting planets as we go smaller and smaller in terms of in terms of mass. We're getting closer and closer to you know that true Earth analog. We're trying to find an Earth-sized planet around a star like our sun in the habitable zone. And you know, Express is one of the first instruments that's capable of making a measurement like that. And I, I noticed that you you're saying capable of and um, potential. And Deborah, you sort of hinted before, kind of a stay tuned for some news. Yes. <laughs> um, I won't put you on the spot, but it sounds like, you know, it, it said, you know, you've been working on this a couple of years and it sounds like it's, you're getting some results that we might be hearing about. I, yes, we are working on two or three papers right now that I think are incredibly exciting and that really show the potential um, of you know, of what we always hoped Express could do. Um, so, but we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, well, but I, I think in the coming few weeks, um, we'll have some announcements that will come out that will, yeah, that will be the, what yeah. we've been waiting for. <laughs> here's, a, here's a question for all three of you. Um, compare the amount of observing time to the amount of time to reduce that data. Okay. Because you're, I think the question is you're you're collecting, especially Joe. You're doing it every day with with uh, lost. Um, how long does it? Is there some <clears throat> ratio of collected data versus how much it takes to reduce it? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, so we're very fortunate with Express and the LDT that we can actually observe the sun pretty much from sunrise to sunset. Uh, some of the other instruments around the world that have solar telescopes aren't quite as fortunate as us in that our system is basically fully automated and express really we've set it and we i won't say we forget it that does our technicians a great disservice but on a daily basis we don't worry about tending to the instrument and so that really makes the switch from daytime to nighttime observing very fast and so yeah we observe uh, the sun for about eight hours every day on average uh, the reduction, yeah, we've got to keep on top of it because the data keeps coming. And so I don't have a number for how long I spend every day reducing data and analyzing the data. But, you know, we're getting quite good at this. We've been working on exoplanet science for, what, 25, 20, th almost 30 years now. And so we're getting quite good at our analysis techniques. And, uh, yeah, we're... Uh, we're churning through it. So I would definitely say we observe more than we spend reducing and analyzing, which is good. So you'll have, uh, it's job security. If, if I can just jump in, um, because I've been doing this for so many years. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, we, to analyze one night's of, worth of data and probably one day's worth of data for Joe as well, uh, it takes about an hour for the computer to crunch through all of the data. And then to analyze the velocities is super fast. Okay, so, so that will take uh, minutes to, to get one measurement of the velocity once we have the spectra analyzed. 
but that doesn't count all the years and years I put into writing the code so that we could get to this point. But I do remember a time when we were first starting to detect exoplanets and my colleague was giving, uh, Paul Butler was giving a talk at Harvard University announcing you know, the planet and, and he got just exactly that same question. How long does it take you to analyze the data? And at the time in the 19, mid 1990s, the computers were pretty slow. And so it would take five days to analyze the data from one night. And the whole audience just laughed when he said that. So we've gone from five days to analyze one night's of data to an hour now. That's a good, good number. Hi, right, Catherine, do you have anything to add and you, for, with your work? Sure, yeah. So my data is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, like I said earlier, we can observe up to hundreds of stars a night. And so we typically get a few hundred gigabytes of data per night. So um, it takes a bit of time to work through, but we are not observing every single day um, in the way that Express is. So we get a little bit of time off to reduce our data, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, here's a little bit more of a general question for any of you. What's the furthest planet um, from Earth that's been discovered so far? Oh, oh wow. So the, okay, so the furthest, uh, yeah, and the clarification is the furthest from the Earth. So you're talking about a host star that's very far away. And I, you know, it's it's got to be something like a thousand parsecs, right? Um, which is can still you, can you a, tiny, that? a tiny can you translate region parsec? of our Milky Way galaxy, galaxy. Yeah. Yeah. Can you um, put parsec in different numbers for our Sure. Um, well, one parsec is 3.26 light years. So the distance that light travels in one year is is uh, is one light year. And, and so 3.26 times that is a parsec. So I guess a few thousand light years. And but then just for reference, if you think about light going around the equator of the Earth, light could go around seven times in one second which always makes me realize like how mind-blowingly far one light year is. And so, so then I guess a, a follow-up question to that is, what, what's the furthest um, Earth-sized planet that you could expect to, to detect with Express? All of those, all of our carefully chosen target stars are actually relatively close. And we did that for a couple of reasons. First of all, the stars, the brightness of the stars are is greater when they're close when they're nearby and so we get higher signal but we're also really thinking about the next generation of spacecraft that are going to go out and study these planets and look for life in in the planets on the surface of the planets and so there it's also important that the stars are and the planets are relatively nearby uh, so that the images can resolve this, the planet and see it as separate uh, from the star as it goes as it goes further further away, you know, it becomes a point source, the planet and the star. So we really, th these are stars that are closest. And maybe the most exciting one is the, the, are the planets around Proxima Centauri. So Proxima is the closest star uh, to the sun in the triple star system, Alpha Centauri. And Deborah, since your vocal cords are working well right now, here's a question specifically for you. Um, you've been studying exoplanets your entire career, what inspired you to focus on this? I honestly, I was just so lucky as in for my PhD, I worked on spectroscopy, which is the technique that we're using to find exoplanets with express. And it's just that I finished, I was finishing up grad school just as the first exoplanet was announced. And I just feel incredibly lucky that I had the opportunity to join this amazing team um, in California, searching for exoplanets just as I came out of grad school. So it's, um, yeah, it, I, it, I think it was a matter of luck, but I mean, yeah, who, who wouldn't want to do it? I don't know. <laughs> I think yeah. it's pretty exciting. <laughs> okay, here's another question. Are you, are you researching any planets from the great cluster of Hercules? Joe? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I have no we're, idea. <laughs> we're really, yeah, we're really looking at just this, the very closest stars. So mm -hmm. not stars in other clusters, but it's a super interesting question about what uh, those planetary systems would look like. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one for all three of you. Um, when you're observing, what's, what's a typical observing session look like for you? 
That's a fun like question. I, I think it'll be very, yeah. yeah, it'll be very different for Express and for, for Catherine's work. For us, you know, we slew to the star and we set our exposures going. We have, because we're a modern instrument, we have this wonderful interface. You kind of press go and you get to watch, you get to watch the photons arrive live. It's so much fun just seeing the data coming through. But for the speckled imaging, I know that's way more hands-on. Yeah, so as I was saying, uh, we observe many, many targets. We're moving from target to target every few minutes. And a fun thing about the LDT is that you get to do it yourself. So um, you're constantly paying attention to when the data has been stored. And you say, OK, time to move to the next one. And you slew the telescope to the next target and you start taking data on the next target. So um, it's pretty, pretty active observing when you're using a speckle camera. But there's one other lucky thing. So the, my team is so amazing. Um, Joe and the students and postdocs and professors who work on the team are so amazing that we can actually observe and run the Lowell Discovery Telescope from our laptops. And I don't know if I should confess or not, but I was once on an Amtrak train <laughs> collecting data as I was rushing to get home and, and start the night observing. So you can do tele observing from anywhere these days. <laughs> Here's a question from one Dr. Gerard Van Bell. And Catherine, I don't know if this is like Gerard's final attempt. Yeah, to, you exam know, question. <laughs> what's the most exciting thing that will be discovered in the next 10 years? Is that being directed towards me? Then? It's not, but I wonder if Gerard is, you know, it's his last attempt to, you know, see how you perform under pressure. <laughs> well, I think it's a really exciting time in astronomy. I think there are going to be lots of really great discoveries in the next 10 years. Um, it's hard to say what the greatest will be. I, this is a planet sec session, and so I um, guess something that's many people are excited about right now is that JWST recently launched and it's going to be uh, looking at these cold faint stars that I was talking about, a lot of those, uh, it's observing in the near infrared. And so um, I think there will be some really interesting discoveries there. I think we're gonna learn a lot more about potentially habitable planets, what it means to be habitable, um, the sorts of um, molecules and the composition of atmospheres of other planets. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing what sort of atmospheres are out there on other planets. Yeah. You guys, what do you guys think? I think 10 years is really tight for this discovery, but I would say life, the signatures of life in the atmospheres of other stars. And and the thing is, is it's going to require the right tools. And so we're doing reconnaissance right now with Lowell, um, the Lowell Discovery Telescope and Express to find the potential worlds. But it's going to require follow up probably from space, first with James Webb. Catherine, that was a great answer. Um, but I think from next generation, from the extremely large 30 meter telescopes that will be, will be built on Earth to the large um, telescopes that will fly in space with the capability to image and collect spectra of exoplanet atmospheres. Stati we are going to start collecting statistics on those worlds and statistics on what the atmospheric composition are, is, and we'll be able to figure out what fraction of other planets have life on them. So to have gone from this period of time where we, you know, and before 1995, we thought maybe most stars don't have planets. And right now, you know, we can look back and say we were just ignorant. We didn't have the data. And so right now we can make a statement that maybe most planets don't have life, but we really don't know enough yet. And I think we're going to transition across that threshold in the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah, I agree. Really I think... Yeah, I think uh, I was actually at a, a big exoplanet conference just two weeks ago. And so obviously this was, you know, the question of the day. And uh, we got to see some great talks on this. And I think 10 years too is quite ambitious. Um, I would love for it to happen in that time. I think we're closer than ever before. For me, I think exomoons is also a really exciting thing that we could find. We could find these moons that orbit these much bigger planets 
And those could potentially be really good harbors for life. You know, there's a lot of interest here in the solar system on Jupiter's moons and their potential to host life. And I also think uh, one idea that really caught my eye was being able to detect oceans on exoplanets. You know, really thinking that we've gone from, like Deborah said, in 1995, not knowing there was a single planet out there beyond our solar system, to being able to detect oceans and the atmospheric signatures of these planets is mind blowing. I think, yeah, the day we detect an ocean on a planet, I think that's going to be really, really cool. That's great. We, we're just about out of time, but I want to try to get in a couple more quick questions. Um, one for Catherine. Um, and this is from Cody Halfmoon, our marketing manager. So I think she's looking for information for me, social media and stuff. We're always looking for stories. What are you most excited to possibly discover now that your career is about to start, as it were? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I'm sort of in the process of shifting what I have been working on for the past five years to what I would like to work on for my postdoc and uh, for my future academic career. Um, I'm particularly interested right now in understanding the types of system architectures that exist uh, throughout our galaxy. So we're pretty familiar with our own solar system right now, uh, but our solar system is actually pretty unique. Um, the sun is not the most common type of star and uh, many stars are in these multi-star systems. And so how do planets exist in those systems uh, with multi-stars? multiple stars and how do planets exist in systems with stars that are unlike our sun. So um, I would say right now I'm most excited to discover the type, the different types of systems that are out there. All right. Well, in one minute or less, Deborah, we'll give you the last question. What inspires your interest to find other potential life in the universe? Uh, I think that's a sort of philosophical question. I am just always curious about how things work and what our place is in space and time. And so for me, that's it. Like, what is humanity? You know, what, what else could be out there? And what are the, yeah. So I, I think it's just understanding the bigger context. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, we're unfortunately out of time. This has just been a great discussion. Dr. Joe Lama, Dr. Deborah Fisher, Dr. Catherine Clark. It's been a pleasure having you on here. Thanks to everybody for joining us. And I, I'm not sure who, if anybody realized in the beginning, we were scrambling a little bit. And thanks to Nate Nice, Heather Craig, and Maddie Mooney behind the scenes, who um, did a lot of maneuvering to make this all happen tonight. Um, thanks so much to them. <laughs> thanks, everybody, for watching. And Deborah, we got you out. Those guys made it happen. So. <laughs> Thank you Thanks so everybody. much. We'll, we'll be back next month as we continue celebrating the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>